If you spend any time at all tuned into the news, you know that racial tensions exist in our North American culture. In many ways, the issues are just as complex for today's kids as they were for those of us who grew up during the 60s and 70s. What do youth workers need to know about race, systemic racism, and addressing these tension-filled matters in their youth groups? We'll gain insights and recommendations in a conversation with Dr. Virginia Ward on this episode of Youth Culture Matters. From the Center for Parent Youth Understanding, this is Youth Culture Matters. If you're a parent, youth worker, educator, counselor, grandparent, or anyone else who cares about kids, we're glad you've joined us for this practical, informative, and hope-filled podcast. This is a place where together we talk and think Christianly about the rapidly changing world of today's children, teens, and young adults. Well, welcome, everybody, to another episode of Youth Culture Matters. I am really excited about our conversation today. As always, Jason Soshenik is joining us. Hello. Good to be here. I'll say from Spokane, Washington, that's where you are again, Jason. Same place. um, That's right. And, uh, Jason, today uh, we're going to have a conversation about a topic that's not only, you know, timely now, but it's been timely for almost forever. And I think it's one that youth workers and parents need to be aware of. It's certainly on the front burner we would say of things that are happening in the news and has been for some time and and guys like you and me who grew up where we grew up we don't necessarily always understand a lot of the issues uh, related to discussions about race and the experience of people who do not have our our own uh, experience in terms of our ethnicity so we're going to talk a bit today about youth workers and families and racial issues and get an understanding of that and Jason, the, the gal that we have on here is a very good friend of mine, and that's Virginia Ward. I'll say Dr. <laughs> Virginia Ward, because you just graduated Virginia, Yes, didn't I you? did. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did a great job. Virginia is, uh, or what I'll say was, uh, one of our students, uh, Duffy Robbins and I, along with Adonis Vita, we had Virginia in one of our Doctor of Ministry to, uh, Ministry to Emerging Generations cohorts at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. I'll let Virginia tell you a little bit about herself. We'll maybe dive into some of what she did in her doctoral research. Um, but Virginia was in, in that cohort. And I think that, you know, the thing I'll, I'll say first and foremost, there's so many things that Virginia can talk about. She's experienced in youth ministry. But as an African-American woman who now, this is where it gets dangerous, mm-hmm. Virginia, because I'm not going to ask your age, but I think you and I are pretty <laughs> yes, close. Yes, we are. Mm-hmm. Right? We're very yes. close. And I'll just say, I will say nothing about your age, but I turn 60 <laughs> next month. So, but Yay. you and I grew up. Yeah, you and I grew up, you know, at the same time in our country's mm-hmm. history, but our experiences were markedly mm-hmm. different. And so we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about that. But but first, you know, Jason doesn't know you Mm. Uh, folks who are listening. Some of them don't know who you are. And I know they're familiar with your name, I'm sure, from a lot of the training you've done. But tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and what you're doing now. And I want to hear, too, just your official title at Gordon Conwell, because I know you're working at Mm -hmm. CUME. And people need to hear about that. So th- thanks for coming on, Virginia. I'll let You're you talk. You're welcome. Thanks, Walt. It's great to be here with the Center for Parent and Youth Understanding. So I have been in youth ministry for a long time, so over 30 years. My husband and I have been married for 32 years coming up this August. Two grown children, out of college, all that wonderful stuff. Started out in urban youth ministry kind of as a, as a mentee, as it were, of Dean Borgman, which you know, Walt, as well, and some of the listeners may yep. know. He's in uh, Jason too, because Jason's got some young life. Oh, great, ties. great, great, great! There you go. Yeah. Uh, so I, I remember going to the first class with Dean Borgman and saying, "I want to learn everything that this man knows." So I just like took every class he offered. It didn't matter what it was, anything in, in urban youth ministry, because I was more of a practitioner and in the ground doing it or on the ground doing it, but needed the academic background. So my husband and I have been in ministry for 32 years. In the Boston area, I I am a native Bostonian. We both are, actually. And I have been in youth ministry all of my life, as I can remember. My mother was a school teacher, and we helped her a lot with Vacation Bible School. 
And I've always had a love for working with young people, and it just continued. So I went from a peer leader to being a youth leader, first at an AME church, an African Methodist Episcopal church here in the Boston area. And then when I married my husband uh, in the Pentecostal church in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I've done the bulk of my youth ministry. And so I, I love working in the urban environment. I, I believe it's very complex, and there are a lot of other issues going on there, and we can get into that in a bit. So my background is primarily urban youth ministry, working with high-risk kids, working with kids who aren't as high-risk, kids who from two-parent homes, single-parent homes, you name it. So here at Gordon-Conwell now, what I'm currently doing is, is I'm the director, the official title here is Director of Leadership and Mentored Ministry Initiatives. So that means I'm responsible for a mentored ministry program, which takes urban practitioners and literally sets them in different fields, whether it's a church base or community base, to help them to work out the learning that they've obtained in the past few years that they've been in seminary. But we make them practice what they preach, as it were. Right, and that's through, teach- through CUME, right? Yep, that's Which, through the Center of Urban Ministerial Education. That's the Boston campus is our official title here of CUM. Great. So I'm also responsible for uh, different leadership classes as well as spiritual formation because we know that that's crucial for any urban youth worker or any leader, period, is to make sure that their spirit is formed first. And our youth ministry friends would know you from speaking at a variety of places like National Youth Workers Convention with Youth Specialties. You've been speaking a Mm -hmm. lot with our friend Reggie Joyner in Orange um, Mm -hmm. and other places as well. So uh, Mm -hmm. Virginia is really, really, um, she's locked in on the youth ministry thing. Just out of curiosity, uh, what was the title of your thesis again, your doctoral work? It's a holistic model of urban ministry to youth and families. Okay, and it was good. I got to, I got to be the reader for that. So that was lots of fun to walk through that process with Virginia, who added so much to our, uh, our uh, cohort there. And so it was, it was fun to get to know her with that. Um, so I'll, I'm going to ask. Um, I'll ask the first question, and that is, mm-hmm. you know, and I mentioned this already that being the same age, I, I have been absolutely fascinated by the conversations I've had with you and the way you've opened my eyes to realities of issues of race. You know, this really, I, look, I grew up in a um, upper middle class, white neighborhood, suburban Philadelphia. I All my ministry experience was in uh, white, suburban, upper, upper middle class churches. Okay. I go to Gordon-Conwell, and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Dean becomes a friend, and I took his class. Um, oh, what was it? What was it? To, oh, ra- uh, the Christi- Christianity class? and the Problem of Racism. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I took that mm-hmm. class, and, you know, so this is back in the early 80s, mm-hmm. and I'm reading the autobiography of Malcolm X mm-hmm. and some of the other books that he had us read, and it was it was eye-opening, you know, because mm-hmm. I had to— I had to learn about things in my life that I didn't know existed and really had to mm-hmm. struggle through to even realize that they did exist. You know, as, as mm. for most of us, that's the way it is. But mm-hmm. you, you've mm-hmm. helped me understand this. And, and one of the things that's been fascinating to hear from you, Virginia, is you're, even though our lives paralleled, it was in different places. Talk a little bit about what you grew up with in the 60s and the 70s particularly at the height of some of the, I remember hearing you talk about some of the race riots, and I think this, things mm-hmm. were happening in Roxbury, correct, up there in mm-hmm. Boston? Yes. Yeah. Talk mm-hmm. a little mm-hmm. bit, bit about your experience as, as a girl, as a teenager, um, as someone who is black in America, mm-hmm. in Boston. Mm-hmm. Well, again, Boston is, although it's north of the Mason-Dixon line, uh, Boston has its own set of issues. And, and growing up here, it, I, I like what you said, Walt, about it. they do exist. You, you brought me back to the commercial with the M&Ms and Santa Claus when they meet, and they go, oh, they do exist, and they both kind of pass out. Yeah. I think for, for me, when I, when I, although I grew up in living in a city, the city of Boston, and seeing some of the racial tensions firsthand, I went to suburban schools, so life was very different um, 9 to 5 or 8 to 3 during the day and then in the evening when I went home. Here in Boston, after Martin Luther King was killed, the riots here were unbelievable. I remember driving through certain neighborhoods 
and seeing buildings burn down. And I remember at times even just watching people being hosed. And so that's why I remember at the cohort when sometimes some of the facilitators would say, oh, I know we're, we're getting a lot of information. It's like drinking through a fire hose. And it would immediately, in my mind, the images of seeing black people hosed down with those fire hoses. I'm like, that's not a good thing. Why are we saying that like that's a good thing? I remember also certain neighborhoods, we couldn't go in. And as a young black female, as a teenager, I was told, don't go into that neighborhood. There were certain parts of the T you couldn't ride. Uh, that's our public transportation system. And if you got on the wrong train, as it were, you got off immediately on the first stop that you could, you had to run over to the other side, get back on the train, and get back into the neighborhood where you were received. Now, it's not that way anymore. Uh, in Boston, you can ride the T, you can live in pretty much any neighborhood you want to, but I do remember the city being very polarized. So what I saw on the TV was very much a reality for how I lived. Even the neighborhoods we lived in. When my mother went to buy a house in the suburbs, when we first moved to the suburbs, there were certain neighborhoods, I remember the realtor saying, I can't show you a house in that neighborhood because it won't be safe for you and your children. So I remember that growing and, and up. Why, and, yeah, and why, I mean, I, I, obviously I, I have an idea why that is, but just explain a little mm -hmm. bit about why that is. What was the dynamic there at the time? Well, at that time it was predominantly white, and, and it was some neighborhoods were just being broken into, as it were, with the first black family. So there were certain neighborhoods, she said, we could be the first black family but there were certain neighborhoods that that would not have been acceptable. Yeah. They were still, unfortunately, even burning crosses on lawns. Uh, and so I, re I remember that. So these aren't things I've read about in the books or saw just on TV. I remember experiencing that as a child growing up. And even going to some Christian conferences when I first started speaking in youth ministry, and people, when they saw me getting ready to either exchange my computer with the speaker ahead of me or to put the mic on, I remember being asked, "You are the speaker," and people would just get up and leave. And all right, it, stop. Yeah, you know, stop there and and talk a little <laughs> bit more about that because mm -hmm. it, 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 talk about it, what I want to know is what that was like for you. You know, I never experienced that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I've experienced people well, leaving when I speak, <laughs> uh, but not before. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as, as someone who I am, so there was a time, I'm not reminded as much, but there was a time in my life where I was reminded I'm a black woman every day of my life. So either it was by a look or the, something was said or the way I was treated. So I put that in, a, I'm a black woman. So not only did I have the ethnic piece, but I also had the gender piece. Mm -hmm. But we're going to stick to that ethnic piece today. So I just put it in there, oh, you can't handle what I have to say because I'm black. You have to filter it. That's okay, why don't you go to a space that works for you? I've even had people sit in my room and fold. One guy afterwards uh, had his arms folded and he came up to me was with the arms still folded walking, which I thought was amazed. I was really amazed by that. And he said, well, you know, I had a difficult time listening to you. And I said, well, sir, you had the option to go to about 10 different workshops. So I'm so sorry that was hard for you. I always put it in the box of that's that person's problem, not mine. I didn't own it. I just refused to own it. Did you, you know, as you're talking about this, okay, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about when you stand up and the things that are in your mind, mm -hmm. would you say, and this is where, this, these are the kinds of conversations I love to have to Virginia, because I can uh, have with Virginia, because I can ask her anything. Mm -hmm. Now, it, would that be, you know, as I process that, I'm just wondering, would that be preconceived notions and stereotypes on your part as well? to push back? I mean, I understand what you're saying, but mm -hmm. I want to be sure I mm -hmm. hear you right. I mean, because I can see how this becomes sort of this cyclical, it just it pushes us away from each other. When I... Okay. Does that make sense? You know what I'm asking? Or? Yes. Yeah, I, yeah I, understand, I understand what you're asking. For me, I, I don't... I don't... I'm not putting that... I'm putting that person in in a box so that it, it doesn't hurt in that moment so I can do what I need to do. Gotcha. And then I process it afterwards. If they're open to receiving and hearing my truth and hearing where I'm from, then that's cool. Yeah. But if they are, are going to keep me in a space where they don't allow me to be me, then I put them in that box and it allows me to keep moving on. Yeah. Because to be judged by your, as Martin Luther King said, to be judged by your skin tone and not your character 
then then you're in that minimal level, and I got to put you in that box for now until you can get out of the skin tone box. And, and you've talked about some change in that over the years. What is it like now? I mean, are you still encountering this, mm -hmm. or in our youth ministry world? That's what we're talking about right now. Right, right. Not as much. <clears throat> excuse me. Not as much now. There are still some in some places where you'll get that. Um, I'm trying to think. The most recent experience I had, I went some. I was at a conference. I won't say the conference. And I went and sat next to some people and introduced myself. And it was the awkward silence. It's the I don't know what to do with you. And so they they were co they were courteous, but then they moved within about five minutes. They just got up and moved their seat. And so I said, okay, I know where this is. It's okay. But then other people sat down, and they were like, we saw that. We just wanted you to know that we still love you. And you know, and I was like, thank you. But so there's more awareness from other people now, which which I really appreciate. There's more of an awareness of non-black people. Um, that say you're accepted and I see that unacceptance and I'm not going to tolerate that. Where yeah. before that was, people wouldn't have done that. They would have just left me isolated. So before we break, let me just ask this question. What's mm -hmm. changed? What, what, what is it that's raised that awareness that's mm. allowed people to, to step in and have those kinds of conversations or give you that kind of support? I think the global... Uh, lifestyle that we're all living now. I think social media has helped with that. I think seeing more images of color on TV. I think having people of other colors move into the neighborhood and, and going to school and also marrying. I think you're seeing a lot more interracial families and people can't ignore it anymore. You're going right. to weddings and people are connecting and, oh, they're not what I thought. And, you know, even as much as we talk about Bill Cosby in a bad way, uh, but in a good way, the Huxtables, seeing a, a positive black family that doesn't live in a ghetto, they're educated, uh, seeing positive images of black and brown people on the screen has really helped for people to say, oh, I know you better than just music and food. Hmm. <laughs> That's funny, music and food, because that's right. That's you know, that's what I think for for a long, long time. That's how, that's how we would we would think about that. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. good. This is good. Well, we're talking. We're gonna take a break, but we're talking to our friend Virginia Ward, Doctor Virginia Ward, who is now on staff, uh, faculty up at uh, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in Boston, the Center for Urban. Uh, ministerial education. We know she's from Boston because in the initial segment she said that she started. <laughs> I caught that. She started <laughs> in youth men there back at a certain time. So you're going to hear that. I love the accent. You know, I loved. I love it up there. We lived up there for the first three years of our married life. And um, we're going to come back. We're going to talk uh, a bit more with Virginia about matters of youth ministry and race and some other things happening in our culture. Stay with us. Here at CPYU, we're taking steps to help parents, youth workers, educators, and anyone else who cares about kids help the kids they know and love navigate the difficult issues of life. We've put together a one-day training seminar called Tackling the Tough Stuff that we can bring to your community. Over the course of the day, Mark Penner and I will provide information and practical steps you can take to address narcissism, pornography, self-injury, depression, suicide, and a variety of other tough issues kids face in today's world. To learn more about bringing Tackling the Tough Stuff to your church or community, go to cpyu.org backslash tough stuff or call us at 1-800-807-CPYU. Well, again, thank you for joining us here on this episode of Youth Culture Matters. We're here with Dr. Virginia Ward and having a wonderful conversation, uh, a meaningful conversation around the, the issues of race and, race and ethnicity. And uh, I want to pick up where we left off with regards to um, global lifestyle. You mentioned um, this dynamic of how uh, things are changing because of uh, uh, exposure to more and more messages. And I'm I'm really curious uh, the, the term urban youth um, and the idea of urban what makes someone urban uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong but I feel like it, it's expanding I I I'm seeing more and more um, teens white suburban areas 
that um, are taking on what historically has been uh, urban culture uh, mm -hmm. and applying it to their lives. And so I'm, I'm really interested as an African-American woman how, and, and as someone that studies this, um, how you see this taking place or unfolding and some of your thoughts around that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's great. The the urban conversation it, it has been evolving, and I love it. I think it's great. So back in the day, when you use the word urban, people mm -hmm. automatically saw they either attached it to black people, then they attached it to just the inner city, uh, the economically challenged, the the inner inner part of the city. But now urban has been expanded to not just be the economically challenged part of the city, but also it's expanding to include not just the geographical part of the city, of, of any city scape as it were, but it's also including and, and, and spreading out to not just, be, not to the suburbs, but the term urban is including kind of a metropolitan feel to it. Uh, so now live, being urban or living in a metropolitan area is it's very chic it's very slick people want to live in the uber zone where i don't need a car i can just walk to the market and go get coffee down at starbucks on the corner and and so urban has become a very sleek term also with the growth of hip hop and the freedom that came through the expressions of hip hop the language, the dress, the, the the hairstyles, everything that the dance moves, and it's cool now to be urban. It's where before being urban was looked at as being disadvantaged, and it was just relegated to one people group, primarily black or African Americans. But now it's trendy to be urban. You've got Asian kids, urban. I, I remember going to, to on a missions trip to Africa and seeing a hut. And on the, on the hut, there was no running water, no electricity, but there was a picture of Tupac Sh Shakur. And I'm like, how did Tupac get over here? It's 85 degrees, and kids were walking around in Timberland boots and, and baggy jeans. So the, the term urban has been, um, in a way, neutralized. But in a sense, I'm also going to say it's been redeemed because it's it's now acceptable and it's now it's informing the lifestyle of many so even suburban kids and some of them how they dress it amazes me going to different uh, youth groups out in suburbia and watching them and hearing their language and the music they're listening to driving down the street i'm like whoa i sound like i'm in the city <laughs> or it sounds like you're in the city huh. but i th I think the, the, the basically I just said all of that about urban to say that urban has been neutralized and it's been acceptable because I think economics is also driving that because there's a lot of money to be made in urban yeah, sectors. Yeah, you know, that's what I wanted to ask. I mean, I it, yeah. because I think there's some people who have gravitated, kids who have gravitated towards that in a mm -hmm. meaningful way, in a thoughtful mm -hmm. way. But at the same time, I think there's there's probably, you know, correct me if you, if my opinion's wrong, but maybe even a larger percentage who have bought in without any meaning at all other mm -hmm. than the fact that it's been marketed effectively and they bought into mm -hmm. it because, as you said, it's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's very trendy. So for, you know, for, for those who created um, the, the, you know, the hip-hop sense, the hip-hop scene, the hip-hop culture, uh, where it had meaning when you see people co-opting the look and I say, does that not sit well? Does it sit well? I mean, I guess if you're someone who has money to make from it, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how does that, you know, how do you process that? Well, the, the hard part of that, it, it, it's similar to how, and uh, this is me personally, so I'm not attaching this statement to all black people. Right. It's, it's similar to how we're in the summertime now and, and people is, in the wintertime, people were spray tanning. In the summertime, people are at the beach getting tans, but then you look at me funny because I'm black. And it's like, wait a minute, you're attempting to get my color, but you don't want to be me and everything that I have to walk through. So the same with the hip hop piece. It's cool, I'm listening to the music, but you don't fully understand the struggle behind the original hip hop artist so when they're talking about the establishment and they're talking about some of the political issues and they're talking about how they've been treated by police, there's no point of contact. There's no 
understand, there's no point of reference to what does it mean to be discriminated against? What does it mean to be marginalized intentionally by a systematic process? So it, it's a piece of me that goes, you don't get the struggle. Mm -hmm. But then the other piece is, but I understand it is economics. So would you say that because of uh, more exposure to it, uh, to these messages, does it make it easier or harder for individuals that are coming from um, these circumstances to have their points be heard or to um, have the conversations that need to really be had in the public sphere? Because the background is not known, because the information as far as regarding what the problems are, I think it's making it harder. It's the same statement of, what's the problem? We have a black president now. What do you mean there's still racism in America? I sing your music, I eat your food, I wear your clothes. What's the problem? You get to mm -hmm. ride the bus any way you want to. You're still choosing to sit on the back of the bus. But the systemic issues are not known. So I think it actually makes it harder in this day and time. Let me ask you, this would be a good time for me to ask you this question, and that is define the word racism. You know, give us a good understanding of that. And and then spring off of that and let us know how systemic racism, as a white person, when you feel like, I'm not a racist, you know, I'm sure you've heard that a million times, I'm not a racist. What what is systemic racism? What what do what do we need to well whatever whoever you are ethnically, what do we need to understand about systemic racism that we don't see in ourselves? So, I think for me, when I hear the word racist and you ask me about a definition of what racism is, I I believe that racism is when an individual believes that their ethnic space is better than, is the only way to go, as it were, and you deny the other individual's right to exist, but not just exist, but to prosper, and you stand in the way of them prospering because of their skin color. That's what I believe is racism. You deny them their space because you're saying they are also not made in the image of God, just mm -hmm. as you're made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. And if you deny them, systemic racism to me is when you then act out and you put systems and processes in place that exalt one and put down or even withhold from another. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. And, and, and then a follow-up question would be, explain as Virginia Ward and someone who grew up where you did when you did and someone who is living where you are now and working with the students and the families that you're working with now, what are some of those systems and practices that we need to be aware of? So I'll start, number one, with education. So in some environments, there are students that don't even have books for the, the schools that they attend, the classes that they go to. Others, the type of teachers that they get to pour into them are not, the standards are not the same. So others, the type of food. So in the communities, some of our communities that we live in, the, the foods, fresh foods are not readily available. But I can find ramen noodles with tons of sodium in it or food items that are not, that, that don't promote a healthy individual. Hmm. Some communities, we don't even have a playground. So you, you, you don't have, so there could be a playground over here, but there's no place for my children to play. So those kinds of systematic things that why can't we all have healthy food and healthy and safe places to live and have the same resources that are available in one community, access to technology that are not available in other communities. How... You know, I'm thinking about this, and I'm going, okay, yeah, so so w where I grew up, um, you know, I probably lived eight or nine miles from communities like that. Well, probably, I know I did. 
and mm-hmm. and maybe even may, I'll tell you uh, now that I'm thinking about it as you describe this, not even that far, and and I think about that is in today's world how do I as a youth worker how do I as a parent help mm-hmm. the kids that are entrusted to me uh, mm-hmm. understand the gospel call to you know love neighbor and respond mm-hmm. to these things what are some concrete ways that that I can address this reality other than going wow you know Virginia really described that well mm-hmm. and then we hang up and we get on with life you know what do we <laughs> how do we right. because that's part of the problem right how right, do we right, right, right. how do we what you know yeah how do we respond to this well, I think it, it begins back in the day. I know when I first started here in youth ministry in Boston, there were relationships, partnerships between urban and suburban ministries that were intentionally set. Movements like National Network for Youth Ministry. I remember Dave Kemper here. He reached out and said, okay, Virginia, I know you're in an urban setting. I'm in a suburban setting. Let's come. Let's chat. Let's talk together. Let's build relationship first. So I think it starts with the youth leaders building relationships across color lines and across uh, geographic lines, as it were, geographical lines. So suburban reaching to urban and urban reaching to suburban. So starting with the youth leaders and then beginning to understand and researching each other's worlds. So for me, I've, I've been able to cross and not just live in suburban worlds, but also live in the urban world so I could be a bridge for both and say, For instance, when we took kids to camp, we've gone to urban camps, but we've also gone to camps with suburban kids. And we had to explain that, okay, you want us to go into that uh, pipe with water running on it, but all of these young girls here just had their hair done. And that hairdo costs about $80, and that hairdo was about $120, and that hairdo was about $75. If you cut the water off, we can participate because we don't have washing we're here. So understanding little things like that, understanding each other's culture better, doing the research. So I think that that's something, once you build a relationship, do the research and understand, again, more than just food and music. And then I would say intentionally doing kind of plunges, not urban plunges with the, on a mission side, but bring your youth group to an urban youth group. And then allow an urban group, youth group to come out to your youth group and to hang out and talk and to learn and build the relationship. And it goes back to the, mm-hmm. the number one, when all fails, go back to number one, building relationships. What's been great about being in the cohort with you and Duffy and Adonis is having these real conversations, but feeling safe enough to be able to ask and it's not just you asking me, but me also being yeah. able to ask you, why do suburban yeah. leaders feel this way? Why do they look this way? And mm. I think that reciprocal and that safety in the relationship will bring forth some changes. Mm. One of the things I, I wonder as I'm, I'm listening is uh, I've seen this as I've gone from one community to the next where there's bridges that are trying to be formed. But um, And I really appreciate the words that you've just expressed for building the relationship. I, I just go directly to the beginning of the relationship. Mm-hmm. And um, how often um, it, it, it has been difficult, even in my own experience, of just beginning the bridge building um, mm-hmm. because uh, of uh, it, for any number of reasons, not feeling safe, not knowing what is the agenda, all of these mm-hmm. things, they come into play. Mm-hmm. And I'm mm-hmm. just really curious as um, someone who is white doing ministry um, in a suburban city, um, uh when reaching out to uh, individuals in other communities, uh, not like ours, what might be the initial steps to allow for even the conversation to start? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great questions. So initial steps would be see if there is an urban network near you. Uh, reach out, see if, call, and if not, if there aren't any urban networks near you, then reach out to, this is very simple here, pray and say, okay, God, there are, there are some ethnic churches in my community or in the city that's near my community. I want to reach out to them. Stop praying and calling forth those names of those churches. Look online and see what's the youth pastor's name if you can figure it out. And if not, call the church. Can I have the youth pastor's name? Stop praying for him or her. Then contact them and say, hey, I'm from a suburban church. I'm interested in building relationships Um, with suburban ministries i'm starting with you just be frank with them and tell them up front this is the this is the first step 
I just want to come and meet with you. Can we have coffee, tea, you know, uh, strawberry milkshake, something? Can we break <laughs> bread together and see if there's even a connection there? Because right. if there's no connection between you and that person, then thank you very much. Um, could you recommend me to somebody that this, what you think? You know, see if they have a recommendation of somebody that you can connect with in the urban environment. And, and it's slow work. It's tedious work. As I think of the mm -hmm. networks and the relationships, the suburban relationships I've built, they took time. I had to go and visit them. They came and visited me. I go out and see them, but it's reciprocal. It's not all one doing all the work and one doing all the visiting. And and because the other thing is you want to be careful of from suburbia is you don't want to be a resource, um, lack of a better word, I mean, you don't want to be a resource bank where they're calling you for, oh, can you give us money for this? And will you sponsor this kid for that? No, the relationship needs to be reciprocal. They should be giving mm -hmm. something as well as receiving. Uh, but the initial steps, I would say pray and then search out and say who's nearby or who is the Lord leading you to. See if there are any network meetings that you can go to and meet people. Also, there are, um, there are urban church networks that meet. Like here we have a Black Ministerial Alliance. And a number of the suburban churches started just coming. The pastors, youth leaders, some of the parachurch ministries, they just started coming to the meeting so they could meet us. And then the right. ground was broken, and then we were able to continue further with building the relationships. Mm. This is good. We're talking to Virginia Ward, a friend of ours who is living in Boston doing urban ministry, uh, has lived through the same period of time that I've lived through historically here in the United States. Me as a white man, she is a black woman, and we've had great conversations about this over the years. Very um, helpful and eye-opening and, and really appreciating this conversation. We're going to come back after a short break and uh, finish up with Virginia, talk a little bit more about kids, urban culture, and racism in, uh, in, in our country here and in the church. We'll be right back. In an effort to help you help the kids you know and love navigate their emerging sexuality to the glory of God, we've launched a sexual integrity initiative here at CPYU. Thanks to a generous grant from a company called DAS, you can access our sexual integrity initiative and a growing number of resources for free by visiting the website at sexualintegrityinitiative.com. Well, welcome back. We're here with Dr. Virginia Ward. And before we go any further, uh, we uh, have this uh, tradition here on our podcast to ask five questions, five random questions to get to know you a little bit better. Okay. And, uh, and, and and so I'll, I'll start with, with what I hope is an easy one, uh, but it just allows for our listeners to learn a little bit more about you. Um, Okay. So uh, I, I, I am making some assumptions here. The first would be that you that you read quite often. Uh, and mm -hmm. so one is uh, your favorite place to read. What is your favorite place to, to, to read? My favorite place to read is in the bathroom. You know what? I was just going to say this is a safe question to ask a man. And I really thought Virginia was going to redeem the question and, and – Take it to places that we've never gone before, but I'm just going to be honest, Virginia. You disappoint me, but you put a smile on my face, so that's good. I like that. Sir. There you go. Wait, can I can I just ask a clarifying question? Do you no, just go yeah. to the bathroom no, to do read? No, not. <laughs> Move on to number two. Well, no, that sounded wrong too. Go to question number two. <laughs> go. Yeah. Good clarify. There you I'm glad go. you clarified that, Walt. All right, all right. Okay, uh, the second question. What is the band or artist you dislike the most? Like Ooh. you hear it on the radio or you are, are somewhere and you're like, oh, not again. Justin Bieber. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Justin, like, oh. so you're not a believer. Yeah. No, yeah. not yeah. a believer. Not in that regard. Okay, uh, no, all right. <laughs> okay all right all well, that's right. a good okay, answer from a, a man or a woman so that's yeah, a good, yeah. I like that. <laughs> okay here's the, here's the third one um one item uh that you have seen either on tv maybe late at night or qvc or sky mall the famous sky mall magazine that you would f see when you're flying 
that you saw mm -hmm. when you were flying or on TV and you thought, I want that. If money wasn't uh, an issue, if judgment wasn't an issue, it was like, that looks like the most neat, awesome, coolest thing. Uh, uh, and it's, I mean, it's a total waste of money, but it's like, you've seen it. What would that item be? Oh, what would that item be? Total waste of money. I would like, they have this, um, like this lighted thing that it, it's, it's like this light that you could put that you'll like have perpetual light in your backyard for all the time. Like if you have one of those outdoor porch things, which I want, they have this light that you can shine and it kind of looks like daytime, but it's really not daytime. And you have this perpetual Kind of like an light. elfish light? Is it like an elfish yeah. light? Like it lights it's, up? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. I think awesome. it's so cool. You know what? I, I was afraid where she was going with a lighted thing based on her answer to question number one. I don't know if you've seen these uh, <laughs> toilet seats, and when you walk into the bathroom, there's a sensor on them, and they start, they light up. So, and they light what? up, yeah. Yeah, in the middle of the yeah, night. Yeah, I didn't want just, to go yeah, there. Yeah, all right. Yeah, why do we have to come back to the bathroom again, yeah. Walt? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't okay. take us here. I was just along for the ride. And, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, number four. Number four, a food mm -hmm. that you love that others might not enjoy. Ooh, this will be a good. A food that I love that others might not. Oh, I know. It's called manish water. So it's a Jamaican dish where they take the goat head and they drop it in a big, a big uh, tub, not tub, a big pot, and they boil uh -huh. it down and they add spices and other mm -hmm. things to it. And you eat this goat head soup. It's called manish water because mm. it's supposed to help men. And I ain't going to say no more about what it's supposed to help men do, but it's supposed to help men. All right. Manish water. I'm going to look this up afterwards. <laughs> hey, All Jason, right. remind okay. me, this is the last time we do take five. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, well, I'll close, I'll close with one last question. Hopefully it's one of the easier ones. But your most uh, likable or favorite season out of the four seasons, what would be the one season if you could have it? Uh, longer, what would it be? Summer. I love summer. The heat is, love it. I'm Bostonian, but my family's from Barbados, so I love the heat. Oh, mm. wow. So, uh, so you're, so Boston, uh, I, it's been a while since I've been over there in the summer. Is that a dry heat or a wet heat? It's a wet heat. It's nice and humid and muggy, and I love it. Oh, that's so great. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, thank you for participating. Yeah. That was that was that was You're good. Welcome. That was enlightening. I've seen I've seen Virginia uh, navigate the snow because we're we're up there in January. So I could answer yeah. that question for you. I, I could answer <laughs> for anybody in our cohort, right? That's right. Yeah, no. so, so true. Good, good. Well, that was fun. That was they were they were good questions, mm -hmm. and I and we had we had some good laughs. So it, it accomplished what we hoped it would do. All right, there I'm going to go. shift gears to the serious side here as we uh, spend our last few minutes together. So. Virginia, I, and you and I talked about this not a whole lot. I know you've watched mm -hmm. it as I've watched it, but this mm -hmm. uh, O.J. What was it? O.J. an American story? Made in America. Uh, yes. O.J. Made mm -hmm. in America. Okay, made I drew. America. I drew. America. I had a little. Yep. I had a little blank spot there in my brain, but O.J. Mm -hmm. Made in America. That so seven and a half hours ESPN five part documentary that was extremely well done, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. compelling. Some of the best television documentary work I think I've ever seen. I'm actually going to watch mm -hmm. it again, and I've watched some of the episodes more than once. Mm -hmm. And I think what I liked about it was um, not only was it well done, but I I thought it was fair. And mm -hmm. I, I thought that, that the balance there of bringing in not just the story of um, the crime, uh, the story of his demise, the story of the trial, but a mm. lot of a lot of setting the context for race relations in America. I mean, that really took me back. You talk about the hoses, you know, getting hit with a fire hose and right, things right. like that. We saw a lot of that, especially from the South during um, a lot of what was unfolding with the civil rights movement. So setting the context. I'm just I'll start with this. All right. So as a as a black woman and you said you watched it with Larry right you you, you yes. folks watched mm -hmm. together it, how did you process that what was going through your mind you know just help me understand it from your perspective um as you watched that talk about what you were feeling or things that were provocative and and how they were provocative 
Well, the, we, we watched the OJ series as along with the new roots. So the two kind of juxtaposition with each other it just made for a very interesting uh, con conversation with my husband and I. But it brought back a lot of old memories because my husband was actually installed as a pastor on the same day OJ was running. Uh, the whole highway chase, yeah. but just the whole, again, the, the, the resurfacing of the racial issues that were still alive and well in America. That was the, the sad part about the OJ case, where as a black person, we were hoping he wasn't guilty, uh, but the same token, you didn't want him to be abused by the system. The question was, would he get a fair shake with, by the system, because here was again a black man who had been convicted for killing a white woman and a white male. So it was difficult to separate race out of it. So it, it was more of watching it again was kind of like, oh wow, where have we gone in the past um, X amount of years? In 20 years or so, uh, are we still dealing with the same issues of race? And if so, are they at least on another level? And that was a lot of our thinking. And how did you answer that? When you asked that question, how were you answering that? In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no, because our sons are still suffering from issues of racism. So th with him being a black man and having two sons, that's always, so the whole issues of what's happening with Black Lives Matter and black males being shot down in the street, some uh, for just seemingly for no reason other than the color of their skin. Um, Others are provoked, so I get that. They're not all innocent cases. I get that. So before people start stringing me up here, um, let me say I get that there are issues in the background going on. But we can't help but look at the fact that if they were a different ethnicity, would these cases have gone to where they've gone? Mm. One of the things that came up with the, uh, with the OJ documentary was, you know, as you're – as I was watching some of the history and I was thinking back to the Olympics, what was it, in 68 down in Mexico City, mm -hmm. when the two guys, you know, raised their fists in the air, mm -hmm. uh, the black mm -hmm. power sign. And then the, the other athletes that, that came together, uh, Jim Brown, Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Lou Alcindor, um, I think it was Lou Alcindor at the time, these guys who came together and there were some actually some shots of them around the table pulling together and... Uh, a unified voice. OJ, I believe, was in college at the time at mm -hmm. USC, and mm -hmm. he was really, um, as athletes go, probably on the national consciousness, maybe more than anybody else. And they tried mm. to enlist him. You know, you're you have a voice. You're you're right, prominent right. as an African American, and you could join us, and it would make our message. Uh, spread maybe more far, more wide, with more effectiveness. And his response to them, and I've heard a lot of talk about this ever since this aired, because I don't know if this was, I don't even know if this was known before the documentary aired, but his response was, you know, I I'm not black. He wouldn't join me. Mm. So I'm not black. I'm OJ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm trying, to th I'm, I'm trying to process that. What? Mm -hmm. What did he mean by that? Well, it's unfortunately, and I've heard this from other athletes. Some have said Tiger Woods has, have, has said the same thing. And other athletes who feel like they've arrived to this place of uh, notoriety and superiority that extends race. So they don't feel that as a black man or as a black person that they would be looked at as being associated with the rest of those people, as it were, who tend to have issues because of the color of their skin. So in other words, they, yeah, like, and, and they're saying, I'm not black. I'm not you black. Know, see, I've, I've transcended. I've yeah, I've transcended. I've that. exceeded. I've transcended what the stereotypical issue, uh, thoughts that people have on people with that skin tone. I've transcended that. I'm just OJ. But, but he was reminded and he was a black man in America very quickly. Yeah. And 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 then follow up on that, because then afterwards, you know, when he gets to the point where he's trying to get that memorabilia back mm -hmm. and the documentary in the last episode really portrayed this a, a lot. They mm -hmm. really hit on this hard was now he almost he, he almost swings the pendulum to the extreme 
on right. the other side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So as you watch that, how do you process that? I mean, what? Yeah. It, it's unfortunately just makes me, it made me laugh and say, okay, OJ, welcome back. You thought you could run. Because on one side of it, anybody who's black can tell you, I shouldn't say anybody who's black. I'll just speak for me as a black woman. That's what I hate when people put us all in the same category. <laughs> as a black as a black woman, I sat there and said, okay, he'll be back. He, he'll get the wake up call. And at some point in time, he's going to wake up and realize you are still a black man in America. I remind my sons of that all the time when they're driving. We say, look, you're a black man in America. If you get stopped, put your hand on the wheel, two and 10, and say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, officer, no, officer. So when, when he came back, we said, welcome back, OJ, welcome back. Mm. That's why when he got the, um, the, the, the verdict that he did, black people were rejoicing because they were like, oh, maybe there is a little justice here. But remember, OJ, you are now a black man in America. That's Doesn't good. make it right. I'm not yeah. saying this makes oh, it yeah. right. I'm just saying this is the standpoint because yeah. of the the space of injustice, because of the inequities of the systems. And mm. and neither, as my mother-in-law would always say, two wrongs a right does not make. Yeah. So I want to be very clear. I'm not justifying it. I'm not saying it's okay. Yeah. I am just helping you to understand the oh, mindset yeah. behind yeah, it. Yeah, we get that. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me ask you, because our time's winding down here. Mm-hmm. And I'll ask you maybe the most loaded question of all at the mm-hmm. end, which is totally unfair. But help us understand, you know, what do we need to know and understand about the Black Lives Matters movement? Because mm. it's so polarizing in our culture and people come mm-hmm. to it yeah, all across the spectrum. And it seems to be that the people you hear the most are on the extremes on either side. Mm-hmm. Help help mm-hmm. us understand that, you know, from from the inside out, you know, mm-hmm. as an African-American. Help us understand that Black Lives Matter. Okay. So the best way I can speak about Black Lives Matter is to, to understand that the root of movement, of that movement, is addressing the systemic issues that still exist. The system that was created, and I'll, I'll liken it this way. When I go to speak places and they bring me a microphone, the microphone is generally a battery pack and connected with some sort of headpiece. The assumption is I'm wearing pants. So the battery pack can go on my my belt or pant pocket or, or in a jacket pocket or something. But as a female, sometimes I'm in a dress and I have nowhere, I have no place to hang that battery pack because the system was designed with a man or something generally with a a male in mind. And a man always has a pocket or a belt bucket or something he can hook this onto. But a woman in a dress is not necessarily going to have that. So if you think of that analogy and think of the system, the system of justice in America, the system of the criminal justice system in America was not designed uh, to accommodate people of, I'm going to say, it, it doesn't favor black people. So when black men are confronted with the system, they're stereotyped. So the issues, especially with the law and black men, the assumption is you're a black man in a hoodie, you stole something. Why are you on this corner? You must have drugs, you must have a gun, you're up to no good because you're standing on this corner with a hoodie. Well, maybe they just came from working out and they're sweating, and so that's why the hoodie's on. Maybe um, they're cold, so that's why the hoodie is on. We have a lot of assumptions, negative assumptions, towards African-American males, and particularly African-American males. And when they come to the system and say, hey, I was just standing here, or I was coming from working out, the system says, "Uh, no, that can't be true, Um, and if it is true, all right, will just cite you for being on the corner. But instead of you just getting a citation, you're going to do 90 days in such and such a place. But yet someone else can be caught of a different ethnicity and they'll do what we call white collar crimes or do or do a, even a worse kind of a crime and do less time than a person of color. So I said all of that to say that the Black Lives Matter movement is saying black people matter and when they do a crime, they should do the same amount of time that somebody of another ethnicity would have done. 
Mm. But it's not the 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 judgments are not equitable. That's the best way to look at it. Yeah, that's helpful. That's helpful. Yeah, good. Incredibly helpful. Well, let's let's turn a corner here and finish up. Get very practical, Virginia. Give okay. us. Um, you've got an audience. Let's let's speak to the youth workers here. What are? Well, you know what? No, let, let, let me backtrack. Give me. Give us. We, we got youth workers and parents. Give me mm-hmm. one practical. Give us one practical thought from your perspective on what a parent can do. Uh, something very practical to push back on systemic racism, and mm-hmm. give us one thing that a youth worker can do in the context of their work with students. Same thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I would say for parents, I would say to first of all know your personal uh, perceptions on people of other ethnicities and be under- and understand and be careful of the language you're using to describe people of other ethnicities. Because nine times out of 10, the ideologies that children get or youth get come from their home. So they've mm. heard their parents or somebody at home talking about a particular ethnic group a certain way, and they pick up right on that and they repeat that. So I would say to, to stop and examine your own thoughts on people of color. And then for youth workers, I just encourage the youth group in Boston, or actually out in the suburbs to do this, is to sit down and identify your own ethnic space. To say, all right, are you Irish? Are you German? What are you? What is your personal ethnic background? It's the whole book of cultural intelligence that we walk through. That to see how, do you understand who you are culturally? And how flexible are you in addressing other cultures? And I think if we can understand that, so that we don't say just because I'm white I don't have an ethnicity everyone has an ethnicity and we need to know what that is Mm. yeah so a lot of awareness that's what Dean helped me with you know 35 years ago just uh, Mm -hmm. with that class just waking me up to things that I that I didn't even know existed just just because of how and where I grew up so those are those are great recommendations any we always end uh, by asking if if there's anything, you know, for further reading. You know, where would you send us to read? Give us a book or two that's that would be helpful. Uh, they could be classics, you know, older books. Mm-hmm. They could be timely. You know, what what do you mm-hmm. think? What do you think would be helpful? Well, the the biggest classic of all is still "Divided by Faith." I think that's that's a great classic one. Um, there are some newer ones that are out. Sunshine Ra. Yeah. If you really want to push into something and really challenge your thinking, uh, his book, The Next Evangelism, it, he that book really addresses some is issues. It, is it The Next Evangelism or The Next Evangelicalism? I'm not sure. I'm not correcting you. I'm just wondering if yes, that's it. Yes, no, it is. It is The Next Evangelicalism. I okay. keep saying The Next, yeah, The Next Evangelicalism. It's the one about the church and Western cultural, yes. Western cultural yeah. captivity. I can say that. Yes, I can. Um, and then he has a, a, the, his other one, also the cultural, the many colors one, Sun Chan Ra. He's a, a great author in, in addressing that and stirring the thinking in that area. Yeah. I also like uh, Brenda Salter McNear. She has um, The Heart of Racial Justice. She has that one. And especially since most suburban spaces or youth leaders seem to work out of the space of social change. Um, I like that book on the heart of racial justice. She addresses some things in there and covers um, some points that I think are really helpful. And and what? And then if they oh go ahead. I'm sorry. I say if they really want to jump in, as you said earlier, the autobiography of Malcolm X, just to understand the thinking, um, is is that's a good one as well. Okay. And uh, Martin Luther King's right. He had a he mm-hmm. wrote an autobiography. I have that I uh, at home and I read that a few years ago. That's another another good one. I'll throw in mm-hmm. another one. I love baseball books, so the autobiography of Jackie <laughs> Robinson was one of my favorites. Mm. That's an excellent okay. one as well because you get back in as a baseball fan, mm-hmm. you know, back before I was born, uh, a bit of the dynamics of that. And my beloved Philadelphia Phillies played into that story in not so nice ways. Um, mm. you know, so it was interesting to read that. So we'll put uh, mm-hmm. links to all these books up and uh put the list up as always we'll we'll ask you to uh if you're interested in any of these books visit our friend we'll include a link byron borger at hearts and minds uh, bookstore in dallastown pennsylvania a great independent bookstore and he'll set you up with this virginia this is 
This has been really helpful. Thank you so much. And Jason and I were talking. We're going to have you come back. Thanks for yes, joining please. us. We're going to let you get to oh, your meeting. Oh, thank you. Jason, you want, you want to take us out? Well, it, honestly, I, I, you took the words right out of my mouth. I, I was going to say we need to have uh, Dr. Virginia Ward back on with us. This has been really enlightening, and we're so thankful for your time uh, that you've given to be able to, to just bless you. us with yeah, your knowledge. So uh, with that, we want to thank you for listening to this uh, episode of Youth Culture Matters, and we look forward to being with you on the next one. Thanks for joining us for Youth Culture Matters, a podcast from the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. If you'd like to learn more about today's youth culture, visit our website at cpyu.org. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, email us at podcast at cpyu.org.